What is nominal GDP path targeting? It is a communications policy that a growing number of economists want the world's central banks to adopt. How does it work? The central bank publicly commits to do everything in its power to keep the level of nominal GDP on a steady, rising path. In particular, many economists want central banks to promise to return nominal GDP to the trend it was on prior to the global economic crisis in relatively short order. What good is a promise from the central bank? And what power does the central bank have over nominal GDP, anyway? The central bank has a monopoly on the production of monetary base, which it may produce in unlimited quantities at essentially no cost. Injecting more base money into the economy, other things being equal, increases the overall level of money expenditures, also known as nominal GDP. This is due to the fact that the general public only wants to hold on to so much base money at any given point in time. Thus, the central bank is almost always able, within a margin of error, to hit whatever nominal GDP target it chooses for itself. Why do you say it is almost always able, rather than always able? Because every once in a while, the economy winds up in a so-called liquidity trap, in which the more base money the central bank provides, the more base money the general public wants to hold on to. This may temporarily prevent the central bank from accelerating nominal GDP growth as much as it wants to. Isn't that precisely the situation we find ourselves in? Kind of, which is why simply expanding the supply of base money does not seem to be accelerating nominal GDP growth. The trick, however, is that liquidity traps do not last forever. Even if the central bank cannot boost nominal GDP growth directly today, it will be able to do so again in the future. What good is faster nominal GDP growth in the future, if what we want is faster nominal GDP growth today? Suppose you operate a business. If you suddenly expect faster nominal GDP growth in the future, you suddenly expect more customers to be willing to spend more money on your products in the future. In order to meet this extra demand, you must increase your investment spending today. Or suppose you're a consumer. If you suddenly expect faster nominal GDP growth in the future, you suddenly expect to have more money income in the future, which makes it easier for you to borrow and spend today. And so on. Expectations of faster nominal GDP growth in the future accelerate nominal GDP growth today. How may the central bank best convey to the public that it will generate enough nominal GDP growth in the future to keep the level of nominal GDP on target today? That is the beauty of nominal GDP path targeting. If the public expects the central bank to generate insufficient nominal GDP growth in the near future, then it will also expect it to generate proportionately faster nominal GDP growth in the distant future, for the purposes of catching up to the targeted path, which in turn will raise expectations of nominal GDP growth in the near future. If the central bank's policy is credible, then nominal GDP may never significantly deviate from its target path simply because the public doesn't expect it to. Isn't this magical thinking? Far from it. Many central banks explicitly target inflation, promising to keep it at approximately 2% per year. In these countries, inflation rarely deviates significantly from the target. If the public expects the central bank to miss its target, they also expect it to adjust its stance until it once more expects to hit its target. Thus, inflation expectations stay in line with the target, which keeps inflation itself in line with the target. Which brings me to my next question. Why nominal GDP? Why not inflation, or unemployment, or some other target? Unlike a nominal GDP path target, inflation targets forget past failures. If a central bank fails to produce fast enough nominal GDP growth in a given year, its target for the next year is proportionately higher. Thus, inflation targeting is vulnerable to liquidity traps in a way that nominal GDP path targeting is not. It also makes the stance of monetary policy sensitive to real shocks to the economy, which the central bank can only make worse, not better. Unemployment targeting is problematic as unemployment is always due to a mix of real and nominal factors, while central banks only control the nominal and the long run. Okay, but what does this have to do with the economic crisis? How would coordinating nominal GDP expectations at a higher level fix the economy? 
About two-thirds of the variation in real GDP growth is explained by variation in nominal GDP growth. This is because prices are sticky in the short run. And Okun's law says that about three-quarters of the variation in unemployment is explained by variation in real GDP growth. Unless there is no slack in the economy, and there obviously is, we should expect faster growth in nominal GDP to be accompanied by faster growth in real GDP and a declining unemployment rate. A stronger economy would also improve everyone's fiscal positions, easing financial and housing pressures, while lowering the government's debt-to-GDP ratio. Not all of our problems are nominal, but many of the biggest and most recent ones are. And you're not worried about hyperinflation? No. A nominal GDP path target imposes a ceiling, and not just a floor on nominal GDP growth. Hyperinflation is caused by hypernominal GDP growth, which would violate any reasonable nominal GDP path target. I have emphasized the benefits of nominal GDP path targeting with respect to stimulating the economy because that is what is needed right now. But the case for nominal GDP path targeting is just as strong with respect to keeping inflation at bay, which is what may be needed in the future. Where can I learn more about nominal GDP path targeting? You can start by reading the blogs of market monitors, most famously Scott Sumner, who has done more to promote this policy from the very beginning of the crisis than anyone else. You can also check out the recent endorsement of the policy by Goldman Sachs Economics Team which offers more detail as to how the policy would play out in practice. Okay, thanks. I still think this is a bit off the wall, but I'm more open to it than when we began. Well, that's progress. Here's to hoping the Federal Open Market Committee is as open-minded as you are.